So I'll get started. Um, my name is Dawn Konachek. I've been a tax consultant for 14 years and then I've been teaching it for 13 years. Thir uh, three years in Wisconsin and 10 years here. So I think I know a little bit about tax. I've been doing it my entire life just about. So um, I have a lot of humor in this slide, whatever, but um, if you have questions, please stop, okay, or ask the questions in between or whatever. So anytime, just stop me. So a change in the game plan. I know this whole thing is a change in the game plan because before you guys couldn't get money off your NIL, but now you can. And so I've got a couple uh, slides. I had to admit that I had nothing, I, didn't, I knew nothing about this. So when Shane asked me to um, talk about this NIL, I was like, what is that? And so I had to look it up, you know, and so you guys are familiar with the NCA new ruling, right? You can um, accept endorsements, monetize your social media presence, and work with professional firms to make more money, right? Um, and the NCA cannot bar modest payments. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide. So, and basically what's important about this is the NCA rules prohibit the school and its employees to pay you directly. They, this school cannot pay you directly. It's the firms that pay you directly. And so um, it's also important when I was talking that you have to check um, ISC regulations on what's necessary. If you're gonna start making money on NIL, you, there's a lot of things you gotta check. You gotta check your ISU regulations, check with your compliance officer, check with a lot but you have to I put the um, website on here make sure you comply with all the rules and the website right here is one that you should look at you know just in case because you don't want to be caught not following the rules on some of these this um, money earned but my issue is with tax issues there's also contract reviews so it's the tax side that I'm going to talk about and it's really important because you could be slammed and surprised at the end if you don't know these rules you could be in trouble at the end if you're gonna make a lot of money so and I'm not sure how much I, I've heard college students at other universities are making a lot of money I'm not sure what um, the students here are doing I heard some are doing a social media presence already so but there is bad news and I wrote don't shoot the messenger because I do have bad news I mean obviously you know, the T word has implications. T word meaning tax. You know, and the IRS states that all income is taxable unless specifically stated otherwise. And it's not just income, it's services and products that you guys receive. If you receive any benefits, like the use of a car, or you get, you know, somebody pays for your travel, you know, for whatever, it's taxable. So, and if you don't understand that, you'll be hit with the unfortunate news on tax day that you owe a bunch of money. And that's where we don't want you to be at, you know. So if you've got friends that you know are getting money off their NIL, have them watch this, okay? Because they don't want to be surprised that, you know, they're getting services and products. They're not getting cash, right? They're getting service and products and they're taxed on that. They don't have the money to pay that tax unless they put that aside. So, um... So, and again, you are taxed on anything or everything you receive of value. That's including services and products. Again, I heard that somebody was um, getting the use of a car. You know, just the use of the car over time. That's taxable. The person who is issuing that car needs to send out this tax document to that student at the end of the tax period saying, 1099, the use of that car is valued at maybe 20,000. You got to report that on your tax return. Do you have the money to? Did you have the? You know, did you save the money to pay the tax on that twenty thousand? That's where you're going to get in trouble. So, but I'll just put a caveat in here. Your athletic scholarships. Somebody would say, are those taxable? And for the most part, athletic scholarships are not taxable, unless um, the scholarships are used for anything other than required fees, tuition, and books. So if you use your scholarship money for room and board, like eating and for rent, that portion's taxable. But any scholarship money you guys get above and beyond that, you know, is not. If it's over, for tuition, it's not taxable. So that's because I've had that question before. Someone's like, well, you know, scholarship money, we get that for free. Is it taxable? And I'm like, no, there is an exception. And remember, the IRS says every all income is taxable unless specifically stated otherwise. Scholarships are an exception. So, 
Um, so again, a scholarship or fellowship is tax free only to the extent it does not exceed your qualified education expenses, your, your, your books, your tuition, um, any fees. If you had to buy a computer, that is a qualified tuition expense, can qualify. Room and board is not. And the scholarship has to specifically say that you are not required to provide services because if that scholarship says you're going to get this scholarship only if you play, you know, football for ISU, unfortunately, it's not a deemed scholarship that would be um, taxable. So there has to be a caveat saying you don't have, that you are not required to do anything to get this athletic scholarship. So make sure that that um, yet if you get your scholarship, that there's no caveat saying you have to re you're required to do anything for that. Otherwise, it's taxable. So again, qualified expenses does not include you know room and board, travel, research, equipment, other than like a computer that you need in the classroom. If you need a computer in the classroom, that's a qualified education expense and um, is not taxed. So does that make sense? So that's the good news. Scholarships have an exception, but there's no exception for this NIL. There is none. So. So again, the new ruling on this NCAA states that the NIL payment cannot come directly from the university. It comes from these you know, firms that are sponsoring you for endorsements and things like that. So this means you're not an employee of the university, but an independent contractor. Do you guys know what an independent contractor is? Kind of work for yourself. That's what it is. You are now probably, you can now probably say I'm self-employed. Well, what happens with self-employed people is they're reporting their income, they're reporting their deductions, so all the money you make on your NIL is reported on Schedule C. You know, and unfortunately, you know, there's two taxes on it, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So, basically you'll receive a 1099 tax form for any money you earn from the NIL, like, you know, somebody, like, let's just say, a car dealership said you could use a car for their endorsement. Well, they are required to issue a 1099 to you guys. You get a copy of the 1099, the IRS gets a copy of the 1099, you have to report that as income. So they're required to issue that to you. You will have to file Schedule C on your 1040 to report that income as an independent contractor. You're self-employed now. Does that make sense? So, um, but if you're also self-employed, you can also take ordinary and necessary business deductions to earn that money. So let's just say um, a company wants you to endorse their product, you know, you're doing endorsements, you're traveling, you can take that travel expense as a deduction. So that's the good thing, you know, versus being an employee, you just get a W-2 wage. You'll report this income, but you'll take all your necessary business expenses. Does that make sense? So, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later here. So, any questions on this? Is it overwhelming? Yeah. Well, I just, on your very first premise about, this goes back to scholarship. Um, our students do have obligations, right, to go to practice and to go to their classes and to yeah no, no, required to go to classes and things like that but are they are you required to play or do they, they have to go to practice they, they have, have to go to, to practice go to but are they required to play for the team well, I would say if um, the coach says go in they couldn't say no I don't want to yeah I mean so the coach is probably different in the sense that the coach is telling the you know the guys to play it's when that scholarship is issued, it can't, there can't be anything on there saying, okay, we're gonna give you this $20,000 scholarship only if you play for us. You know, so, it ha it, so oh, the I scholarship see. can't say that specifically. I see you're saying it's, yeah. it's um, contingent upon them being a competitive. Yeah, um, it says, and the scholarship does not represent payment for teaching, research, and other services required as a condition for receiving that scholarship. No. You know, so basically, if, so, if you get injured during the year and you can't play, they can't withdraw that scholarship. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah you're talking about yeah. actually Not taxable. Also, with scholarships too, I'll go back to scholarships. If you're within your first four years of um, um, at school, you get a credit. It is a wonderful credit to get. Um, 
you can maximize your credit, um, the American Opportunity credit with that scholarship, I mean with um, your tuition here. So I, that's another day, another time, but I just wanted to let you be aware of that there's, for tuition, there is credits that you can take, so. All right, where am I here now? All right, oh, I have a bit of a tax humor. I love tax humor, uh, let's just hear. Um, it says that, I think I can get us the tax credit if we start cooking the books with solar heat. This one says, our ads promise you the biggest tax refund possible, so we're instructing your employer to withhold 300% of your paycheck this year. <laughs> this Glassbergen, um, he's really, um, we're hoping to appease the tax gods by offering a human sacrifice and your name came up, so. <laughs> A lot of tax humor. Why? Because tax is so dry. <laughs> so, I don't know. There's a lot of fun with it. Okay, so now to the nitty gritty of the NIL. Again, it's taxable, but, so this is, this is where it's tricky, and I was talking, what's your, Robin, mm -hmm. um, about this. Now, how you earn that NIL income matters. So if you did nothing, and you just got money for it, like you did nothing for this and someone gave you money, you didn't do anything to actively earn that money, it'll be deemed passive income, meaning passive, you, done, you did nothing, you just sat uh, you know, around eating bonbons, right? If you were active in you know, making that money, like putting things on social media and things like that, you're active in making that money, it's considered non-passive. And why it's important is right here. Non-passive income, the one where you're active in making that money, is subject to income tax and self-employment tax. There's two taxes. There's two taxes. If it's deemed passive, it's just subject to income tax. It is not subject to self-employment tax. So you need to know that. So people are gonna be like, hmm, what would you rather have, passive or non-passive? Obviously passive, right? But there's some um, ugly points to passive income as well. So basically, the IRS has seven tests for determining material participation, but and you have to meet only one of them. And I didn't list those here because they're kind of complicated. The real test you have to ask yourself is, was I active in making that income? Did I do something to earn that income? If you did, it's deemed non-passive. And if it's non-passive, two taxes. So did you guys know about the two taxes? Yeah. So, so in examples of non-passive and passive income, like service-based income, commercial, social media revenue, those are non-passive. Royalty income, I'm not sure if you guys will run into royal inco uh, um, royalty income. Basically, it's uh, payment for the use of patents, copyrighted works, natural resources, franchises. I don't think you're gonna run into anything like that. But um, other passive income is like interest income from banks, dividend income from stocks, gains or losses, things like that. So again, passive income is stuff that you're just, you're just here, give you the money. We just like you. You did nothing for it. It's passive income, not subject to self-employment tax. Okay, so so if, if someone is just allowing uh, a photograph to be used with their name on it or something. They're not, they didn't do anything. Except it's passive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's deemed passive. So this is going to be an important um, detail for you guys. It's just like, did I do something active to make that income or did I do anything at all, right? Because if it's passive, again, not subject to two taxes, only one. So big, big determination. Did you have a question? Yeah, so would that apply like, if you're actively looking for like sponsorship, like, hey, I want this, I want to. No, because you're sponsorship. actively looking, you're not getting the money. It's okay. once you get the endorsement or get whatever, you know, you're earning that income off of, are you doing anything? Like even doing social media and putting stuff in social media, that's active. You're actively doing stuff in social media, even though you don't think it's active, it is. You know, so. All right, so again, you're an independent contractor. You have to file Schedule C. So some common deductions that you can take. Remember, you're reporting, you're reporting all your 1099s that you get for even if you got cash, you got services, you got product. You gotta get these 1099s, you're reporting it all on Schedule C, but you can claim deductions. And so one of the biggest ones I think for you guys would be mileage. You know, driving to an NIL engagement would be considered a necessary, ordinary business expense. This year, this last year, 2021, um, or this year right now, we're still in 2021, it's 56 cents per business mile you can deduct, okay? 
Meals, um, an ordinary meal taken during your lunch break is not deductible unless you're traveling and cannot eat the meal within a reasonable distance of your tax home. So I would consider your tax home probably where you've, you know, where you've, uh, where you live basically, right? So um, if you're a reasonable distance and you can't get back, those meals can be deducted. Um, it says the IRS defines your tax home as a city or general area where your business is located. So wherever you're doing conducting business, right? Business meals are 100%, um, it, there is 100% deductible in 2021. What a business meal is, because before those are personal meals up here is when you're, you, you can't get back home in a reasonable time, you can deduct that. But a business meal is um, you pay for a lunch. Granted, you know, the companies that want to sponsor you will probably pay you the lunch, but just by chance you paid for the lunch and you talk to business, you can deduct that. You can deduct that. Supplies, anything necessary for you to carry out your business, any cash, that you forked out, any ordinary expense you forked out to do this business, you can deduct, okay? So here's the big one. Somebody asked about this, clothing. And somebody said, well, can I deduct the clothing I buy? And I said, well, if you can wear that clothing in the normal course of everyday life, like you bought this clothing for this endorsement, but you can wear that clothing out and about in public, you can't deduct it. So you can't only it's only if you know it's kind of like you know how janitors wear the one piece suit you don't want to wear that out they can deduct that kind of thing but if it's the type of clothing that you can go out with you can't deduct that so if you bought a really nice suit you, you can't yeah because you can wear that suit out you know besides just doing that endorsement right so yeah you can wear it to your first day on the job or you can wear it to your first interview so that's why they say you can't deduct it so if you can if it's stuff that you can use over and over you can't deduct that do you guys have any other uh, questions on on deductions i, I suspect travel you know mileage the 56 cents lodging probably you can deduct lodging anything that you um you have to travel travel to california on business you can deduct that as well, lodging. So it has to be ordinary and necessary to do your business, to if, conduct your business. If their image is what's being sold or exchanged for, whatever, um, can haircuts, manicures, stuff like that be deducted? No, haircuts and manicures, you can, um, is it an ordinary necessary business expense again? Is it necessary to get a manicure? You know, um, haircut, you'd get a haircut, whether you, you know, those are things the IRS probably wouldn't like, you know, but um, traveling to your endorsement engagement, you have to, you know, you have to travel, so you're gonna get 56 cents per mile on that, so. But yeah, manicures and things like that, no. Clothes, no, so, alrighty. Um, so you are subject to the regular tax. I'll talk about the second tax. So you are subject to re regular tax on your Schedule C income. Um, Schedule C income is your 1099. Remember, you should be getting those 1099s for your services, for cash you receive, product, minus your business deductions. But the standard deduction is a lifesaver. And this is um, where if you're filing, you're not being claimed on your parents' tax return, and you're single, you'll get this standard deduction of $12,550 um, that will offset any income you make. Does that make sense? So that's a good thing, right? So I wrote an example here. So let's just say you have 1099 income of 80,000. You got 80,000 for selling your name, um, image and likeness. And your business necessary business expenses included meals, supplies, mileage, 46,000 miles at 56 cents is 25,760. So you just net those, right? Take that and subtract those deductions. Your Schedule C income for the most part is $29,240. If this is your only income and you're single, you get to take that standard deduction of $12,550, offset that with the $29. So your taxable income is now $16,690. And I looked at the tax rate schedule here. Um, you, the marginal tax rate is 12% um, according to the tax rate schedule if you're not claimed as a dependent on your parents tax return okay 
If you are a dependent on your parents' tax return, they can claim you. Um, typically, the dependent individual can claim the greater of $1,100 or to $350 plus earned income not to exceed the $12,550. So it's a little, dep it depends on if you're being claimed by your parents or if you're being um, claiming yourself. So um, how much of the standard deduction matters, but it's kind of a good thing. $12,550 offsets your income. So, make sense? Okay, it's good? Okay. All right, two taxes, are you serious? Yes, I am serious. Unfortunately, you know, up here, this slide, any net schedule C income has ordinary, you know, you're taxed on that, but you're also subject to this self-employment tax. It's 15.3%. It's quite high. But I'll, I'll talk about a minute. There is a deduction you can get for half that. So independent contractors are subject to self-employment tax if you are active participation, right? Like you are active in making that money. It's considered non-passive. You're active. You're subject to self-employment tax. If your net Schedule C income is less than 400, you don't have to file Schedule C. It's so minimal, right? You don't have to file it. And also the rule states that if the contractor, like um, for the use of a car, if they, um, someone gives you the use of a car and it was under $600, the value of that, that um, company does not have to issue a 1099. And then people say, well, then I'm not taxed on it. Not true. They don't have to issue a 1099. It's just you still are taxed on it. Does that make sense? It's, 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 if your Schedule C income is under 400, you don't have to report it on Schedule C. But a lot of people think, well, I never got a 1099, so I'm not taxed on it. They don't have to, and they're not required to issue a 1099 if it's under $600. Doesn't mean you're not taxed on it. So, so the self-employment tax is 15.3% on the first 142,800 of income. It's maxed out, you know. So, who's going to make 142,800? I don't know, but it's 15.3%. You know, on top of your other uh, ordinary tax rate on that on that income, you have two. So here's an example. If you received a W-2 wage of $25,000, if you got a W-2, your income, you have tax withholding, right? You have tax withholding. And your net Schedule C income is $150,000. You made a lot of money on your NIL. You are only paying FICA tax on $117,800. Basically, it's that cap of $142,800 less the $25,000 of W-2 wages because W-2 wages automatically have FICA tax taken out. So, but it is 15.3%, it's high. Again, claiming deductions help you reduce that income and your self-employment tax, so keep track of all your deductions, write them down. The IRS, if they ever come to audit you, they want a log of your mileage, where you went. They require that. If you have that, they won't question it. Um, but, again, there is also another deduction. You'll get an above the line deduction for half the self-employment tax paid on Schedule C. So you will get a deduction for half. So you're, again, you're subject to the 15.3% on your Schedule C income, but you also get half as a deduction for that. So does that make sense? So how do you get that deduction? That you report it on your 1040. So basically, you, you know, your 1040 is your tax form. Mm -hmm. You, with your tax form, the 1040, you file Schedule C. The schedule, then you're going to file the uh, Schedule SE to calculate your self-employment tax at 15.3%. So you're paying tax of 15.3%, but then you get on your 1040, there's a line specifically allocated half of the self-employment tax you paid as a deduction. So it's on your 1040 already. Does that make sense? Yeah. So whatever you pay in self-employment tax, it is taken as a half of it's taken as a deduction as well. Oh. So it's all on the 1040. And the 1040 is just for uh, if you're a contractor, correct? No, no, no. So, okay, so you are going to file a tax form called a 1040. Everyone files a 1040. Um, if you're an independent contractor, you're going to file Schedule C. And Schedule C is an addition to the 1040, it's an attachment to your 1040. So, Schedule C states, okay, I've made this money off my NIL, NIL, I have these deductions, here's my net income. That net income on Schedule C will flow through into a line on your 1040. 
So it's an additional schedule that's attached to your 1040. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's a schedule. So schedule C for independent contractor, all that income flows into your 1040. Good questions, you guys. Alrighty. All right, kitty tax. So remember, I'm gonna quiz you. Which income, passive or non-passive, is, is passive or non-passive is subject to self-employment tax? Active, non-passive. Non yep. So everyone's like, well, we like passive then, right? Because we're not subject to self-employment tax. But if it's deemed passive, there's an issue for you guys. So here's a little bit of an issue if it is deemed passive. It's not subject to self-employment tax. Um, you're still somewhat in a conundrum. I had to look that word, how to spell that, but I, I put it in there. So if it falls, if the income you earn is deemed passive, you have to ask two questions. One is, is a student athlete claimed as a qualifying dependent on another person's tax return, meaning your parents? Are they claiming you? And then the second question is the amount of passive income from the contract um, whoops, in, and personally in excess, I have to change that, and in excess of 2,200, 2,200. Those are the two questions. So if this is passive and you're being claimed by your parents and you make more than 2,200, what happens is your income, anything above that 2,200 is gonna be taxed at your parents' rate. So typically your parents' rate's gonna be higher, right? Typically. And I said, so for example, if a dependent student athlete, you're being claimed on your parents, makes 10,000 of passive income from our NIL. You're not doing anything to earn it, they just give you this money. Um, 7,800 of their passive income would be taxed at the parents' tax rate. So you're like, darn, you know? So, you know, the question is, is do you like your income being non-passive or passive, right? It seems like you're running into a roadblock with both, so. Or you have to get off what your parents' tax. You or claimed on your parents' tax. On your tax, if you're not claimed on your parents' tax return, then this will not be a problem, you know? But, so if, if you're not claimed, it's passive income, you're not subject to self-employment tax. You're just sub subject to your regular tax. So, but then you have to battle that out with your parents. I so. Say, so if your parents like claimed you last year, then you could not, you don't have to be claimed this year, right? No, even though your parents can claim you last year, you take that determination every year. Okay, so then if they didn't claim you last year, they can still claim you next year. Oh yeah, it's not a rule that if they claimed you last year that they have to claim you this year. Basically, your parents can claim you if they provided more than half your support. Okay. You know, basically it's, it's uh, the rules are, are you related to them? Yes. Um, have you lived in their home for more than half the year? Now, school, being here at school does not count for that rule. So if you, you know, so if you live with them, maybe after school, that qualifies. And three, have they provided more than half your support? If they have, they're gonna claim you. So those are the rules there. But again, all this NIL income can be passive if you do nothing and they're claiming you, this is gonna be a problem. You're gonna be taxed at their rate, whatever their rate is. So it seems like you can't escape any, it's just not, the IRS does not let you escape from anything here, do they? Is there any age limit on claiming children? Oh yeah, there is an age limit on the kitty tax. I didn't put that in there. So it's um, 19 years old. They change it, it used to be younger. It's 19 years old if you're not going to school. If you're going to school, it's 24. So a lot of college athletes, you know, qualify for that. So if they're still being claimed by their parents, they're gonna be subject to the kitty tax on this pa um, passive income. And the parents' rate could be as high as 37%. It's the highest tax bracket, so. Alrighty. All right, not done yet. <laughs> All I've talked about was the federal taxes. You know, the federal taxes, two taxes, self-employment and regular. There's state taxing implications too. And the problem is, is some of these athletes might have to travel to Utah, to California, to wherever. What's gonna happen is you're gonna be taxed in Idaho if you live here, and you're gonna be taxed in that other state as well on that same income. So it's not doom and gluten yet, but you are taxed. So, so every state has its own rules. Also, like a lot of people right now, you know, they'll get a, um, you know, a W-2 where they earned money down in Utah, it'll say Utah, 
and they'll get a W-2 in Idaho and it'll say Idaho, you have to file income tax in Utah, income tax to Idaho. So, but in your case, you guys are going to get 1099s. So if you earned income in Utah and got a 1099, you got to report that to Utah. You do. Um, so like if you traveled there to like go to a function or something, now, did you earn money? If you just travel there to go to participate in a function, that's not, you're not earning money doing but that. But like if they paid you for your being at that function or something, but it's not. No, I wouldn't say, so if they paid you for just being down there to go to that function, that's not really an income earned in Utah. They're just paying you to go to a function. But if you go down there and actually earn money down there besides you know not having to go to a conference or something like that but you actively did something in utah to earn that money that's the money that'll be taxed in utah and in idaho does that make right, sense so i don't have a great example but if the company that's in that's uh, contracting with you for your name is based in california you live in in idaho yeah you're gonna have to pay idaho tax but but since the money's coming from a company in California, do you have to pay in California? Yeah, you have to pay in California. Yeah, yeah if you earn, if you if you didn't even um, like, if you earned that money in California and never stu stepped a foot in California, but you earned that money in California, they're going to expect you to pay California tax. But you get a credit again for those taxes paid on your Idaho tax return. So everyone always forgets about the state taxes. It's now also. You know, um, it's uh, it's an additional tax ramification. So, um, all right. So here it is. You pay federal tax. You pay self-employment tax. You have to pay state taxes, right, on this money. So, typically, independent contractors have to pay quarterly estimates. Like, has anyone ever had a W two wage? Have you ever worked for a company and got a W two? You have federal and state withholding already on that. But if you're an independent contractor, you're not paying any taxes. You're not having federal withholding or state withholding. And so if you're an independent contractor, self-employed, and your if your net income is greater than a thousand, you need to consider making quarterly payments. And they're they're due April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. So Here's the rule, it says generally internal revenue service will not assess an underpayment penalty if both of the following apply. You expect to owe under $1,000 in federal taxes for 2021 in, in, in final balance, and you pay in the smaller of 90% of the tax to be shown on your 2021 return. Well, you don't know what's gonna be on your 2021 return, right? That's a ridiculous rule, I think. They say you have to pay in at least 90% of your tax this year. Well, you don't know that. That's why people always go to the second rule. That's you pay in 100% of the tax shown on last year's return. You're not gonna be subject to a penalty. But if you're an independent contractor making your own money and you're making, and you, you're making a substantial amount of money, you should consider making quarterly estimated tax payments to both federal and state. Because at the end of the day, April 15th deadline comes in you don't want to know that you you know you haven't made any quarterly payments. You owe a tax, you know, let's just say of twenty five thousand to the feds. They're not only going to ask for that; they're going to ask for interest because you didn't make quarterly payments, and they're going to subject you to an underpayment penalty on top of that. Jeez. Yeah. So if you're going to make a substantial amount of money, consider making quarterly payments on those dates. They're due on those dates, and that'll save you on April fifteenth it'll save you from at least underpayment penalties and interest. So, I know this is just really bad news, I'm so sorry. And if you make a ton of money, like I, I've heard some football players are already making millions of dollars, I would suggest, now I'm not sure if anyone here, and you could, you never know, right? If you're gonna make a lot of money, instead of being an independent contractor filing Schedule C with your 1040, incorporating set up a single member LLC and the importance of setting up an incorporated entity is liability for liability purposes because and I wrote this example here if student athletes um, can hold camps back at their hometown let's say it's a basketball camp and the athlete doesn't have an LLC and one of the campers gets injured the person that they would not they would most likely sue is you 
and they can go after um, they'll go after your personal assets if you're not incorporated they can so if you set up an LLC and that person sues you the only thing they can go after are the assets of that LLC they cannot go after your personal assets so if you're making a boatload of uh, money consider and it's you know you have to um, incorporate in Idaho uh, pay a filing fee whatever but it's this liability people can't go after you personally you know if someone's injured they can um, they just have to go they can go after the assets of that LLC that's it so and then the last one is Vita this is probably the most important to me so I um, did, been doing Vita for 13 years three years in Wisconsin 10 years here what Vita is it's called uh, volunteer income tax assistance I have accounting students and some students that just want to learn how to do taxes they we prepare taxes for free to the community and to college students on campus and this would be if you're going to learn earn money from NIL and have to file schedule C I would highly use us because um, we are providing free service so um, it's from January 27th to March 31st in the rendezvous room, uh, rendezvous building room 213 um, we're going to do it every Thursday night from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, it's free e-filing service. Um, you have to, your gross income is approximately 57 or less. You know, around there. You know, it's not a hardcore. It has you know, it's about that. Um, and there's at least three levels of review. There's a preparer, there's a reviewer, and there's a final reviewer. And I've got people in there helping me that have been doing taxes for years that help me with this. And we can file Schedule C. And the other thing that's important that I didn't put on here, if you're, uh, are any of you in your first four years of college here? Um, and if you've got scholarships, um, typically, here's another thing. If your scholarship money is greater than your tuition, like you've got, let's just say you've got scholarship money of 25000 but your tuition that they list on your 1098T is 10000 the 10,000 minus the 25,000 is 15, right? That excess is reportable as, as taxable to you, that excess, right? You won't be able to get a credit. But we, I know, because I've been in the profession so long, that even though your scholarship money is greater than your tuition, I can still get you a credit, even though that's different. I just have to plot more into income, and it always turns out better. So more of the scholarship money will be reported to you as income, Hence, you can get a, a, the maximum amount for American Opportunity Credit is um, 4000 So we know how to maximize that credit if you're within your first four years, even if scholarship money is greater than your tuition and expenses. So, but I think this, I think you should tell your friends about this, you know, because we can file your taxes, free e-filing for state and for other states. If you do NIL engagements in Utah, we can uh, file your um, Utah tax return, your Idaho tax return, your federal tax return, and we can handle it all. So states other than Utah as well? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, other states, yeah, okay. uh, anywhere. And, and why 57,000? That's just, for VITA, VITA is an IRS run program, and it's just one of the rules with IRS saying, hey, the income has to be around, they have to earn less, about 57 or under. I've gone a little bit, uh, obviously under that, but I've gone, uh, you know, at least I've gone a little bit over that too. It's just a number to gauge it by. Mm -hmm. It's not like it has to be 57. I've done people who've made 60, you know, so because you just, you know, it's just around that figure. So it's an IRS led program. So the program we use is a tax layer. It's by the IRS. They sponsor that program. So, but. It's a great service. Yeah, it's a great service. So my question to you guys is, do you have any questions about all these taxes you could be possibly assessed? And you know, I guess the warning here is also, you know, if you got cash for your services, obviously stock some cash away to pay for your taxes, right? But if you um, are given a service or a product, you're not getting cash to help you pay for that the tax on that product or service. And so that's where students are going to run into problems, like the use of a car. You're not getting cash to help you pay for that, but that use of that car, they're required to issue a 1099 your taxed on it. And then you're like, well, I don't have the money to pay for that 
car. So I want students to be able to think about if they are getting the use of a car, maybe a Camaro or a Corvette, that's really cool. But at the end of the day, you're going to be taxed on it and you have to figure out how to get the cash to pay that. So. I know you're shaking your head. <laughs> so let's say uh, someone signs up for your name, image, and likeness, and the compensation would be free meals at their restaurant or something like it's that. It's taxable. So is it on the um, what they charge for the meal? Yeah, it's the value of the meal, and they're obligated. So if, if the value of the meals, the free meals, is over $600, they have to issue a 1099. If it's under um, 600, they don't have to issue a 1099, but it's on your honor system of reporting that. So, yeah, again, everything's taxable unless specifically stated otherwise. And one of those specifically stated otherwise are your scholarships. So, but this lesson also is important to other people in general, not just NIL you know money it's important to be able to learn this you know on what things are taxable and how do you report it so and paying possibly estimated uh, payments on that because again schedule c people people who file schedule c they're not paying typically paying taxes you know they're at the end of the day they're like oh my gosh i never paid in any money i never had anything withheld and on april 15th they owe a boatload of money kind of hurts <laughs> so yeah Anyway, so you can be happy that you've learned this tax knowledge, but don't be depressed because it's a lot to absorb. It is, but yeah, I think that concludes. Well, thank you, Dawn. Yeah. I appreciate it. Do you have any other questions at this time? No? Yeah. Hey, um, you know what? If you need to contact me or if you've got anyone that needs to contact me, um, you know what? I should put that right here. Uh, my email is k-o-n-i-d-a-w-n at isu.edu. Awesome. I get a lot of tax questions. I bet so. A lot. Yeah. So, but you know, I like helping the students out more so, you know, um, uh, I get a lot of people who I, who I do um, taxes for in the community through VITA. They think I'm their free tax consultant the entire year and I'm like, ugh. <laughs> You know, I got this job to hold, you know, so, but if it's for students, I do answer your questions. And again, Vita, use us and tell your friends about us too, because um, the students, it's learning, it's, 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 the students learn how to do taxes, you guys are getting them for free, it's a benefit for both sides. It's a great service. And last year we did 500 tax returns. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 500, keeps growing. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. It's really helpful.